Blog Talk Radio. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Losing Your Parents International Radio Show. I'm broadcasting from Portland, Oregon. My name is Lisa A. Snyder, and I lost both of my parents to cancer when I was in my 20s. Uh, my dad died when he was 54 years old, the day before my 23rd birthday, and I woke up next to him, and he had died. And when I was 27, my mom uh, passed away from Hodge. Oh no, it was my dad, Hodgkin's disease lymphoma. My mom passed away from AML leukemia, and I was present um, while she took her last breath. When I was present for their illnesses and witnessing their deaths, I had to face life as a young person without them. So I decided that it was important to me to connect with other people who have also lost their parents. I'm 33 years old right now, and I write and I talk about my journey to healing my grief and working through life's challenges that come up in creativity and self-expression. My blog is called losingyourparents.org, and my goal is to bridge the gap between grief and joy at every opportunity. If you'd like to get in touch, um, please contact me. On my website, losingyourparents.org slash contact. I'm also on Facebook today if you'd like to post on there. Or if you'd like to call in, I'm going to experiment with that, 619. If you're listening to this live um, and are not listening to the pre-recorded show, 619-924-0723 is the number here. That's 619-924-0723. Or if you go to blogtalkradio.com slash losingyourparents, um, you can call in via Skype. I also have a sister site called griefpost.com. It's totally anonymous self-expression, so if you can go there anytime you want, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and share whatever's on your mind. So uh, today my topic is forgiving ourselves. And I want I think this is a really big topic that could possibly be broken down into a lot of different shows. But... Um, Forgiving ourselves is a really important part of the journey uh, when healing, and there's a lot of stuff that happens in the past that we hold on to. I was watching, um, I was watching a Byron Katie event, and actually, let me rewind a little bit and tell you a little bit about Byron Katie. Um, I'm a really big fan of her. She has this process about thoughts called the work. And I don't know if any of you have heard of it. If you Google the work or Byron Katie, it's not Katie Byron, it's Byron Katie. <laughs> it's an amazing process of moving forward beyond the stories that we tell and the thoughts we believe. And um, so a little bit about her. She, uh, while she was in a halfway house for women in 1986, um, she experienced a life-changing realization that she says, quote, I discovered that when I believed my thoughts, I suffered, but when I didn't believe them, I didn't suffer, and that is true for every human being. Freedom is as simple as that. I found that suffering is optional. I found a joy within me that never disappeared, not for a single moment. She calls her self-inquiry method, called, it's called the work. She's taught people all over the world at free public events, prisons, hospitals, churches, corporations, shelters for survivors of domestic violence, universities and schools, weekend intensives, and she also has a nine-day school called the School for the Work. So here's how it goes. It's actually, the idea of it is pretty simple, but you have to be able to dive in to some of these feelings that we may want to avoid. Um, So this is really a process for you if you're ready to make some internal changes that then change your external world. The process is a way of identifying and questioning any stressful thought. It consists of four questions and a turnaround. This is a way of experiencing the opposite of what you believe. So the four questions are, one, and we'll do a little exercise um, around this. I'll try to. Um, so one, is it true? Is is that thought that you're thinking true? Is it true? Number two, can you absolutely know that it's true? 
Can you absolutely know that that thought that you're thinking is totally true, 150% true? Number three is how do you react and what happens when you believe that thought? So you may feel stressed out, you may feel sad, whatever it is. Who would you be without the thought? The turnaround involves considering the thought in a reversed form, changing subject and object, changing yes and no, or changing it to be self Reference, referential, referential, <laughs> can't read that word. <laughs> Changing it to like be involved in yourself. So for an example, the thought, my husband should treat me better, <clears throat> turn it around and include, I should treat my husband better, or I should treat myself better, or my husband shouldn't treat me better. So um, it sounds a little complicated, but it's actually really awesome because it really allows you to open your mind beyond the limiting thoughts of whatever it is. So I was watching the Byron Katie live event. Um, if you go to livewithbyronkatie.com, um, she has an event every once in a while. This is the first time I've ever watched it. And she was going through the work with some live people, and or with some people live. And two of them were around parent stuff, and I thought, and people who have passed. And I thought to myself, this is an amazing process which can help you to heal and to move forward in your life if you haven't forgiven um, yourself for something that you did or said in the past, especially in regards to parents that have passed away because. You feel like, wow, I didn't say that thing or I didn't do that thing or I was this way or I was that way. And there's a lot of pain that continues to occur in your daily life about things you did or didn't do, things you said or didn't say. And so I witnessed this Indian woman going through a process of her aunt had died. Um, I don't know if it was recent. kind of sounded like it was within the last couple of years. And she... Uh, she was having a hard time forgiving herself because she said, I was in her hospital room and I didn't say I love you and I feel terrible about that. And I, I, you know, so Katie, Byron Katie actually took her through a process of, <clears throat> you know, is it true? Is it true that you didn't love her? That you didn't say you loved her? And you didn't show her that you loved her. Is it absolutely true? Can you absolutely know that it's true? And the answer is no. Um, Why is the answer no? The answer is no because you can't know. She couldn't know that she never, ever told her aunt that she didn't love her, like that she she loved her. She, she, um, because she did. There were times in her life she did tell her she loved her, and she would show up to the hospital uh, with flowers, and she got her a sweater, Um, when she couldn't buy one herself, you know. So going back to the questions, how do you react and what happens when you believe the thought? When she believed the thought that she never told her aunt that she loved her, um, she felt incredibly guilty and sad and she was crying. And then who would you be or who would she be without the thought? Um, So, you know, one of the things that that she might be is more free. She'd be more free without the thought, I didn't love my aunt or I didn't tell her that I I loved her. And um, one of the turnarounds was I didn't tell myself that I loved me, which is a really interesting turnaround because I think a lot of times we focus so much on things that happened and things that we feel like we can't change. And so you can't change the path, but you can change the thought around the path. It really helped this woman to move through this process. And um, there's actually something I'm going to be posting on my website called Judge Your Neighbor. And actually, if you Google it, Judge Your Neighbor Worksheet, you'll be able to find it too. But it goes through the process. There's some videos on her website, thework.com. It goes through, how do I do this worksheet? And she actually does it with her daughter, which is really cool. And so the worksheet is actually, um, let me pull this up. Um, 
So you fill in the blanks of this judge your neighbor worksheet, writing about someone dead or alive you haven't forgiven 100%. Use short, simple sentences. Don't censor yourself. Try to be fully, try to fully experience the anger or the pain, as if the situation were occurring right now. So, you write it on paper, and you can do this again and again with as many things as you want. Um, so the first part of this, number one, in this situation, time and location. So think of something you want to, you know forgive for you or somebody else dead or alive in this situation time and location who angers confuses or disappoints you and why so the sentence here is i am insert emotion here like angry with insert name here because so an example of this i am angry with paul because he doesn't listen to me about his health that's one example. The next part of this, in this situation, how do you want them to change? What do you want them to do? And here it says, I want so-and-so to insert action here. And the example is, I want Paul to see that he's wrong. I want him to stop lying to me. I want him to see that he is killing himself. Number three, in this situation, what advice would you offer to them? Paul, or person here, should or shouldn't, Insert action here. So the example that she gives is, <clears throat> Paul should take a deep breath. He should calm down. He should see his behavior frightens me. He should know that being right is not worth another heart attack. In order for you, this is number four, in order for you to be happy in this situation, what do you need them to think, say, feel, or do? I need so-and-so to insert action here. Example, I need Paul to hear me when I talk to him. I need him to take care of himself. I need him to admit that I am right. Number five, what do you think of them in this situation? Make a list. Person's name is so-and-so, description. So example, Paul is unfair, arrogant, loud, dishonest, way out of line, and unconscious. Number six, <clears throat> what is what is in or about the situation that you don't ever want to experience again. So I don't ever want, and then the, there's a blank line here. So the example that she's using is, I don't ever want Paul to lie to me again. I don't ever want to see him ruining his health again. So she says, now investigate each of the above statements using the four questions. Always give yourself time to let the deeper answers meet the question. Then turn each thought around. Look for the turnaround to statement six, replace the words, I don't ever want to with I am willing to, and I look forward to, until you can look forward to all aspects of life without fear, your work is not done. So <clears throat> the four questions, the example of Paul doesn't listen to me about his health. Number one, is it true? Yes or no? If no, move to number three. And number three is how do you react? What happens when you believe that thought? Um, the turnaround thoughts. This is the part that I always get a little bit confused about, and I can understand why anybody else would be confused about it, but here are the turnaround thoughts. <clears throat> a is to the self. B is to the other. C is to the Here are the examples. A, to the self. The opposite is, of Paul doesn't listen to me about his health is I don't listen to myself about my health. This is really powerful. The next turnaround. So what we're doing is we're comparing what is actually true or truer. What statement feels actually like the truth? So Paul doesn't listen to me about his health. That's the thought. To so the other, I don't listen to Paul about his health. And then to the opposite, Paul doesn't listen to me about his health. Oh, Paul does listen to me about his health. Then find at least three specific, genuine examples of how each turnaround is true for you in this situation. <clears throat> so, if you felt like, I don't listen to myself about my health, you could list three things that you didn't listen to yourself about your health. <clears throat> if, uh, in regards to, I don't listen to Paul about his health, you can list three things about how you don't listen to Paul about his health. And the opposite, 
We could list three things. Paul does listen to me about his health. He can list three ways he does listen to you. So this is a really amazing worksheet. You can download this. I will be putting it on my website, um, Judge Your Neighbor Worksheet. You can also Google it. If you're open to doing some work, in case this, this is still work, um, <clears throat> this will change your life. This will change the way you think about everything if you're able to get honest and transparent with yourself because you have to live here in your body. You have to live here in your mind. You have to live here. And if you're feeling uncomfortable in your own body all the time, how much, how much more pain do you want? How much more are you willing to accept? I do believe that for as much pain exists in the world, there's also as much pleasure. <clears throat> for as much anger in the world, there is much love. And if you are willing to take a look inside and see what is the truth, what is the truth about your thought? I'm really interested in this process because it's so simple and you can do it with anything. Um, I really want to learn more. I want to try some stuff on with myself um, because it really, sometimes you want something, like from a parent. Um, you know, maybe you have to, there's something your mom did or said. She's no longer here. The work would be a great opportunity to do that. You can do that with somebody who is dead. You can do that with somebody who is alive. You can do that with someone who is alive who you don't talk to anymore. Might not be talking to you. Um, maybe there's something in the past that you, you did or said that you need to forgive yourself. Self-forgiveness is actually the most freedom you can give yourself because it allows you to be able to do a thousand more things. Love yourself even more. If you're wanting love from a parent that isn't here physically anymore, <clears throat> you have to give that love to yourself. You have to take care of yourself like you are a parent, and you have to parent yourself like your parent would, or better. Maybe it's time to do something that um, your parent never did for you, because I think that that's actually very empowering. Like, right now... Um, I didn't really even think about it until just now. Uh, I've had some kitchen anxieties, and I haven't really wanted to to cook. And I think, oh, I can't cook. I'm just going to go out to eat, and someone's going to serve me, and I won't have to clean it up, and all these things. And I'm not a vegan. I eat everything. But I got a vegan cookbook that was inspired by my friend Heather, who um, lives a vegetarian lifestyle, and so does her family. <clears throat> and she cooks the most amazing meals. And I'm like, oh, my God, this is amazing. I'm impressed and surprised constantly by by how amazing a vegan meal or vegetarian meal can be. So I got this cookbook, brought it home, and I've been inspired to just, like, cook from it. Why? It's because it is uh, approachable. And it doesn't talk to me like it is, I don't know, like all-knowing and um, high and mighty, and I can identify with that. So... What did my parents not give me? <clears throat> I'm not blaming them. I'm not judging them, but I'm just noticing. So I always, as an adult, thought, why didn't my mom teach me how to cook? Why didn't she show me what to do? And sometimes I get angry about that, and it's really not a big deal overall. But, you know, when, when other people tell stories about, oh, my mother, she taught me this recipe, and my grandmother taught me this recipe, and I used to watch my my mom cook and all these stories. I sometimes feel jealous about it, but I'm like, you know what? That's okay that that happened. I'm going to forgive my mom <clears throat> for not having the tools and resources to show me how to cook, um, to not know that that's something that maybe it would be helpful for me as an adult. And I'm going to do that myself. I'm going to teach myself some recipes that I feel comfortable with. I'm going to move through the fears of burning something I'm going to move through the fears of um, having it taste gross or um, 
you know, getting a hair in there or, like, whatever thoughts I have about cooking, I'm going to move through them. I'm going to move through the fears. I'm going to teach myself how to cook and give myself something that my parents couldn't give me. We went out to eat so much growing up. That's really all I know, have known, um, but now it's not all I know. So I'm also going to forgive myself for all the time that's gone by that I didn't cook myself a meal, that I chose to spend more money and go out. And um, because I still do enjoy that, and that is a part of my being. But um, I'm also going to forgive my future self for something that I burn. (laughs) Or, you know, maybe it doesn't turn out great or whatever. I put it in the wrong order in the pan, whatever it is. Um, Something funny about... cooking because there's so many aspects to cooking that are um you know there's so many pieces to the puzzle and I actually look at it as like doing a dance I've been using that language too like I'm going to do a dance now I'm going to put all these things together and I'm going to go on my belly and there's something extremely satisfying about putting something in your mouth that you made eating a meal that you made there's just something there's just something there So I'm interested to know, and I'm putting this out there to you, um, a thought. What is it that you need to forgive inside yourself? What What happened that you need to forgive yourself for? What events occurred that you need to forgive yourself for? I know that with death and a parent, there's a lot of guilt that comes to the surface. Things you could have done, should have done, ways that you feel like you could have saved them or made them live longer. I think that's actually one of the most raw things that occurs once a parent dies is that you think to yourself, oh my God, I I could have told a doctor this. I could have been there for more time. I could have shown up more I could have could have would have should have like there's a reason I don't know why but there's a reason why people leave our lives and that their time here is up and it really sucks I think it's one of the hardest parts about being human is dealing with death and loved ones and no one can prepare you for the death of a loved one and a parent and we suffer greatly if we if we try to think that our life is going to be the same as it was because it's not the only thing constant is change. And you if you want to move forward, and that's your choice, I'm here because I believe in moving forward. I believe in forward movement. I have worked on healing, and there's places inside me that I never thought would be healed. There's places inside me that I'm like, oh, my God, is this ever going to feel different? But I'm choosing to take the tools and resources that are in front of me and apply them to my life so that I can live a happier life because I don't want to live in misery. I don't know about you, but I don't want to live there constantly. And when you're in your mind and you're stuck and you have recurring thoughts and thoughts of the past and thoughts of the future, you're not being present and you are going to just drive yourself crazy. And so if you are committed to your own mental health, which I hope that you are, to work to start the work or continue the work on forgiving yourself for things of the past. There might be a lot of stuff. There might be a lot of stuff there, but you got to start somewhere and you got to be willing to do the work because <clears throat> the thing that I thought about when my dad died, and especially when my mom died, is I am so, I'm in so much pain. I can't see past this pain, but you know what? I don't want to be in this amount of pain when I'm 50 or 60 or 70 years old. I want to deal with it here and I want to deal with it now as hard as it's going to be, as lonely as it's going to feel dealing with this grief and the sadness around my parents. But the work that I've done is significant and I just promised myself that I would do it, that I would do it. And now I'm promising myself that I would do some work and share it with whoever wanted to listen because we're all going to lose our parents at some point. And unfortunately, I lost them younger in my life, and I didn't get to experience whatever 
could have occurred in my life, you know, it's still hard when I know that friends are having babies and they have their parents in life and um, I'm just not going to have that and I have to be okay with it, you know. So there's some there's some struggles and there's some challenges I'm still working on. Um, it's triggering when people have that situation set up and I'm, I go into a tailspin in my head and so I just have to rewind to be like, my life is not their life. And their life might seem perfect on Facebook, but I'm sure there's a thousand things that they're struggling with too because we're all human and we all have our own challenges. So forgiving yourself. Know that anger is really fear underneath. If you're feeling angry about something, it's really you're feeling scared. And so fear is one of the hardest, it is the hardest in my opinion, um, emotion to face because it feels so true. But what fear is is false evidence appearing real. You have a picture in your mind about something the way it should be or the way it was, and facing it and walking down that path is incredibly scary. You have to be brave. You have to put your big girl pants on, your big boy pants on, and walk down the line of fear, even if it's tiny, even if it's facing something you need to forgive your parents or yourself for. It's not easy work, but it is long term. You're going to feel different than you do today. You're going to feel different tomorrow. And you're going to feel different three or six or nine months from today because you did what you did today. Forgiving yourself, working on forgiveness, really forgiving, not just pretending, not just saying, oh, I've forgiven myself, really doing it, really actually loving you, love yourself. You have to do that, especially when you have lost a parent or both parents. You have to love yourself even more because you've got to take care of yourself. And there are, you know, hundreds of thousands of years of, of human beings prior to today that have were born, they had parents, their parents died, they had children, they died, their children lived on. That's how generations work. So we have to face being the generation where our parents died. And I have to do that. I don't love it, but I have to accept it, you know, because non-acceptance really means pain. When you're not accepting the realities of, of and the present moment and your life situation, it causes pain. And so my goal is to bridge the gap between pain and joy and see what comes, doing the work here. So I want to thank you for listening. Um, if you've listened live or if you are listening to the archive show, um, I'd love to hear from you. I really would. I'd love to hear a hello, um, you know, maybe I'm feeling the same way or, uh, hey, what you said the other day really resonated for me. I'd love your feedback. Please email me. Um, you can contact me on my website, losingyourparents.org. And um, one of the most important things to remember is you have to feel to heal. Take care.